this is the first time I'm doing this. Today was short, about 25 minutes. I just tossed questions up and Jordan hit them out of the park with answers. Uh, we talked about, you know, young people in 2020 and what to expect and his advice. Um, so it was great. You should watch all of it. Hello, and welcome to the show, the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. That, no, that's not right. No, welcome to just us hanging out, uh, conversations with Jordan. Um, we're going to bring up topics and questions. If you have questions, then definitely put them down. Mary is going to feed those to me. Um, if it's on YouTube later, then uh, we'll save them and put them in uh, the episode when we revisit it. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Mr. Jordan Weaver. <laughs> Sit there in the chair. Yeah. Wow, it's perfect. You can wear those headphones, actually. Wow. Welcome to your, our, the show. We're doing it. Yeah, yeah. you're our, yeah, I don't know who's it is. How has your day been going? Uh, fantastic. Really? Yeah. No, what? it was windy, so I canceled everything. Okay. This Good. is all I've done all day. Um, I hate the wind as well. Let me tell you something, Jacob. If you have not discovered Wrangler jeans with elastic waistbands, you're wasting your quarantine. I have not. Okay. I remember uh, when my brother was fat as a kid, he would wear <laughs> elastic waistband jeans. It was hilarious. It's different. It's different because every time you tell somebody that, they think it's like the scrunchy top kind, like oh. that your kids wear okay. uh, over their diapers. <laughs> right. <laughs> These are not that. Okay. Um, the topic today is... Hold on. Real oh, quick. Yep. Clarify. Okay. Because this has kind of been the topic is like, we didn't discuss this. Right. Like I'm walking. Oh, that's in a good point. Completely blind. Yeah. So I have not told Jordan anything. So this is Jordan's literal first time hearing this. And the topic is young people in 2020. I came up with a title, a good one. Okay. Uh, I'm 20 something in 2020. Okay. Do you like it? A lot of 20s. I love it. Okay. Um, so I thought a good first what you'll also be 30 something in the 30s yeah that's how time works i'm sorry um a good question to start i thought would be um knowing what you know now yes what advice would you give to yourself at in 20s in your 20s okay um i got married young right. and i don't think i realized that i got married young until i started seeing people behind me that were that age that I was at when I got married. You know, right. like when I turned 30, I saw somebody who got married or was, who was 24 and I was like, man, that's so young. So my my personal experience was interesting because I fell absolutely in love with Lacey, just like my best friend. Right. She was 22, I was 24, she was 23 when I got married. And one of the things that I assumed, I think growing up was that there was a mountaintop that I could achieve that would validate all the effort. And like now we spend a lot of time with a lot of kids in their twenties. Our entire staff almost is young, like rodeo yeah. buddies. They're all young. Um, and one of the things I see that, that really distracts that age is like, you're not a kid anymore. And I think if I was, if I was to, to, to clarify what would I tell myself is like, Hey, wait a minute, aspire to be an adult, mm -hmm. aspire to grow up, aspire to have a family and a job and a contribution, look for ways because I think that's the thing I see is like, there's this desire to sort of prolong the joy of being young. Right. And I think now being, you know, late thirties, um, I see the joy of over the hump, which is once you become an adult and you're able to stand on your own two feet and start to contribute back, uh, there's way more freedom in that. Yeah. Jordan Peterson was talking about the Peter Pan complex where you just want to stay a kid forever. Right. But then because it's sad to grow up. Right. But what's even sadder is to be in a, like, old but a child well you, in your 20s you start to experience it a little bit um but remember when you were in high school and maybe this wasn't your experience but i can think of the kid's name i can think of his face i wouldn't say it but there was a kid that like he graduated but so he's really cool like he would come back a year later and he was the oldest kid at the okay. parties and stuff sure. and then like the next year he was there again and at the end of the second year people are kind of starting to like okay then he's back the third year and it's yeah. like he's just clinging to the glory days of high school and he had been kind of a big deal in high school and i never forgot that even being like like eighth grade freshman sophomore I, i'll never remember forget that kid because i remember thinking like i hope when the time comes i'm ready to sort of turn loose of what was and grab on to what's coming right um and i i mean i know that everybody doesn't look at life the way that i do but i think there's a joy in having something to aspire to mm -hmm. what joy is there in looking back like what sure. do you what do you get out of 
the glory days. There's there's going to come a day someday when you are old and you look back and and you're like, man, those are cool. But um, they can cripple you if you're not willing to kind of start looking yeah. forward. So look forward to the future. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think um, like our society, one of the things that's really hard, our society tells a young person, like culturally, the American dream kind of, if we're not careful, says that you're important based on what you can consume. How right. nice is your truck? How pretty is your girlfriend? How important is your boyfriend? How much money? How much this? How much success and accomplishment? But the reality is you can be very successful and very unloved at the exact same time mm -hmm. and not missed if you were to disappear. Mm -hmm. When you're a consumer, you create a space for yourself that is not like a real loving environment. But if you're a contributor, and I think that probably is something that gets missed a lot, is like if you're a contributor, then you're building a life for yourself and everybody around you. Mm -hmm. Um, Sebastian Younger one time on a podcast actually was talking about, um, he's a, he's a, he's a social evolutionist, but he said that if you're in a jungle and you're the one person that learned how to shoot monkeys and you are yeah. then the food source for your tribe, well, then your, then your tribe gets attacked. That tribe will see to it that they protect you because of what you contribute, not because of what you consume. Like if you're the king and you're hard on people and you're telling people what to do and what to think, you fall under attack. People are not going to be as loyal to you at a personal level as if they would be if you were a contributor. Right. So look for, look for ways to contribute. Um, <clears throat> I see the importance in having somebody to look up to, to inspire you. Um, right now, who inspires you? Ugh. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if I'm being completely honest, I've got, I've got micro, um, how would I say that? micro influences like bits okay. and pieces of everybody sure um there's a guy named roy cooper and he was talking about when he learned to rope his dad said if you can ride like this guy and swing a loop like this guy and get off like this guy and tie like that guy and you put that all into one person you're going to be like the ultimate competitor and they kind of turned out that he ended up being that right um and i would say that that's that like my family you know i talk to my family a lot and and a lot of what i grew, grew up understanding i grew up under the weaver sort of model okay um but i think that's the reason like right now i spend I mean, every time you're on the grounds, I'm driving around somewhere, I've got headphones on. Like yeah. I'm constantly looking for, um, just insight. I want to see sure. different ways of looking at things. And I, and I think one of the frustrations to me is how one-sided people can get is they form an opinion and then look for ways to sort of bolster that opinion. Right. And I would love to think that I could at least, uh, uh, what's, what's the word I, I I'm drawing a blank on the word. I want to be able to at least intelligently defend someone else's argument, sure. even if it's not my own. I want to at least understand the opposing argument. Right. Like when I, when I'm developing an opinion on something, I don't want to know what my tribe or my people say. I want to know what the opposing tribe or the opposing people say. And so for that reason, I think that we've got the opportunity to study under literally almost anyone anymore. Yeah. Well, that actually leads into a, another question, which was, we see you with headphones on all the time. And you say that the majority of the time you're actually listening to podcasts, do you, who, like, who do you listen to or what podcast would you recommend? Um, one of the, I would say one of the greatest mentor influences in my life has been a guy named Timothy Keller and he has no clue that I even exist in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and, and in this regard, like he, he is a, a teacher, but the way that he looks at the word, his perspective at the word taught me how to look at the entire Bible. So now, even if I go to the word, I understand how to begin digging or where to begin digging or critical questions to ask. Like if. I just finished a book called Chaos by Tom O'Neill, and he's a reporter. He spends 20 years studying the Manson murders. Mm -hmm. But the way that he asks questions, by the time the book's over, it's like an 18-hour book, and you listen to it on double speed yeah. so you can go through it faster. Right. But by the end of it, you kind of get uh, an idea of his process of connecting, connecting questions. If this is true, then how can this be true? And if this is true, then wouldn't they ask this? And at first, you're like, man, this guy is brilliant. Well, what you find is that he's such a good reporter because he's got a, a, a kind of a format or a structure that he uses. Okay. And then he just fills information in around that. And so with t people like Timothy Keller, R.C. Sproul is another one. Um, there's, a, there's just a, a ton of Bible teachers. They, it's not the material that they come up with. Mm -hmm. It's the format by which they ask questions. Yeah. And so I hear people all the time go, how do you, how do you go to the Bible and get something out of it? Well, if you learn how to dig, yeah. you can go to any part of the Bible and no matter how boring or dry it is, something's going to catch your attention and critical thinking goes, why does that say that? Right. Why does that say that according to this? Or you compare it and, and that's the joy of 2020 is that you have the ability to go dig up any amount of information that you want. I mean, yeah. you can nerd out on any topic. Well, I've heard you talk about how, um, you read until you find something that confuses you and it's, mm -hmm. it's like why why does it say that that can't possibly mean what I just thought it meant and so right. on and so forth and that's 
why you dig. It's investigating right. why that struck a chord. There's a book by Timothy Jennings. It's uh, a God shaped brain. And one of the points he makes in that that is so good is that you have got to latch on to a cornerstone of your belief, basically a hinge point that everything else can move. Everything else is sort of negotiable, but in your faith, in your, in your life, you've got to have a, a corner post that doesn't ever move. Right. And his, his discussion was that God is a God of love, that God is an altruistic loving source. And anytime you find something in the Bible that questions that cornerstone, then you go, okay, then I don't understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. And you keep digging and what you find is in every single story, in every single verse, and even the scary stuff, even the stuff in the Old Testament that kind of is like, ooh, if you are willing to dig deep enough, what you find is that it reinforces that concept of God, that God is a God of love, not a God of fear. Mm -hmm. And so that that book to me was was really impactful because it allowed me to go, okay, there, the non-negotiable, the essential in my life is that I know that God is a God of love. God can't be a God of fear because the basis of fear is the opposite of love. Mm -hmm. So in my digging or in my investigating, if I read something, it causes me to go, wait a minute, that makes God sound different than I would have expected. Right. One of the best examples is that there was a time where Jesus sort of almost grills a foreign woman and says, you're not supposed to be speaking to me. Well, I read that and I'm like, ew, that doesn't right. seem, that doesn't seem right. right. But what you do is he's looking at her. You can almost, once you, once you know who Jesus is, you can almost see the glint in his eyes. He's reminding her of what the law said and she's acknowledging it. She's like, yeah, I know that's what the law says. She, he brings up the law. She acknowledges the law. She doesn't back away from it. She acknowledges it. And then he pushes through and invites her in more as a child. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, wait a minute. If I would have thought that God was a God who could go, you're not supposed to be talking to me. Then there's the chauvinistic God. There's the sexist God. There's all the things that people can get confused about. But if you've got that corner piece there, then it, it sort of directs the digging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that follows into another question, which is, which, um, intrigued me because I haven't heard it said like this. Um, what should my non-negotiables be as a young person? Meaning, um, you know, non-negotiable core values. Yeah. Meaning, yeah. I, you know, I'm going to college or something, or, you know, I'm, I'm saving myself for marriage or something like that. Like what, I don't know what would be things to tie on to. So let me tell you what mine were and then how they've, how they've changed. Because in the beginning I had one goal in my entire life is I wanted to, um, well, I say that, I say that, let me clarify. Like I wanted to make the national finals rodeo on and I'm 37 and I never even tried. And that's such an interesting, like to say it is like, okay. that's kind of disappointing, but it wasn't a singular goal. Because if it would have been a singular goal, I wouldn't have gotten married. I wouldn't have had kids. I wouldn't have had a job. I wouldn't have moved to Oregon. So, so even though I say that that was my goal, my values were I wanted to be a good husband. I wanted to be a good dad. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have an income. I wanted to have a solid structure. So, so the essentials would be if you can align your priorities according to what the word says, then life gets to kind of fill in around it. Mm -hmm. Because I know people that like they only have one goal and they let everything else go and that becomes an idol. And I think that's where, that's where I start. This is kind of a long answer to a short question, but that's kind of where I see people in their early twenties sort of all over the place. And, and to some degree, I think that's good. I think people should chase a road and chase this road and chase that right. road until they start to kind of develop, you know, their character. But, um, my, my value was that I wanted to be a good, it's, it's going to sound weird, but people that I looked up to were mm -hmm. good husbands and good dads. Right. And I wanted to do that. And if rodeo fit into that, great. If it never did, then I just had to live with the outcome on that. Right. Um, there's a question. What do you see? Do you see anything about American culture that we are blind to? So, for instance, um, it's easy to look back 200 years and say, how could people own slaves? The, right. it's, it's, you know, right. how did they not see the evil in that? Right. What do you think, if any, people will look back? In a hundred years, people look back at our time and say they were blind to that. How could it not be abortion? Okay. How could it not be? Sure. Um, and what's and and I want to be very clear because I know that's kind of an inflammatory position, but we don't take care of the moms. If the church doesn't take care of the moms and love people, I think actually here's a here's kind of a hot take. I think the church actually created the abortion epidemic with shame and fear. You know, we taught that you're not allowed to be in this. We send you off to boarding schools, and we created so much shame around that issue that we actually propagated the abortion issue in the first place. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to rectify that and say, wait a minute, abortion is a big deal. We've got to also go, wait a minute, have we created a safe space for moms who are going, I'm just trying to figure out life. I don't know how I'm going to raise this child. Yeah. The village, right? Like, I don't think that you have abortion issues in communities that are villages. I just don't think you do because you got so much support and so much love and acceptance in that society 
that we've, we've got to figure out that out also. But when you look at the abortion justification, you overlay that on top of the slavery issue. And what you find is it's almost like they're not people. It's not real people. There's no value for human life. There's a disassociative element that allows for people to carry on exactly like slavery to carry on and appease their own conscience while not making the, the necessary adjustments to salvage sure. life in that situation. Yeah. I mean, to the tune of, and I, I somebody's going to fact check me on it. I hope it turns out to be true. But my understanding is if COVID-19 is the reason that Planned Parenthood closes for two weeks, then this pandemic will have saved more lives than it's cost. Yeah. So, I, I mean, if we could start to think of, of children in the womb as being valued, uh, then we need to also step up our efforts to say, is there going to be enough food, clothing, medical care? Is the church willing to get involved or we just want to sit back and throw darts and scream murderer, you know? Yeah. No, to, to accept them and get rid of shame. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and I think shame is the thing that we'll look back on maybe to some degree yeah. too, because the, there's two ways to alleviate shame. And one is the world's, which is to say that it's not bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the most obvious, like, no, shame is not a real thing. It doesn't exist because it's not bad. And I don't, I don't think that's right. But the other is to say that love has this ability to absorb because shame, what shame does is it releases uh, cortisol in our brain and cortisol is our fight or flight thing. And it causes us mm -hmm. to either turn and defend or to run away and avoid. And, and when the Bible says that perfect love drives out all fear, that includes shame. Sure. This says we can turn and face any amount of issues, anything that we've done wrong, any amount of failure, any amount of screw up, that we can turn and face that in a loving environment and create a loving environment. Um, and in 200 years, maybe we'll look back and go, man, the church really had kind of dropped the ball on shame, but we as a nation had kind of dropped the ball on shame. Yeah, too. definitely. Speaking of shame, um, we talk about overcoming and beating resistance all the time. How would you, how do you practice keep, uh, catching every thought captive or, or um, taking every thought captive? My grandma used to say it, um, and I, I know it's kind of cheesy, but it really is true, is that you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Okay. And so I don't think when it says call every thought captive, that verse doesn't say don't have bad thoughts because what, what thoughts would there to be called captive if they're yeah. we're all good? It's saying to be aware. And I, I think that goes back to what Timothy Keller or Timothy Keller, Timothy Jennings was teaching in a God shaped brain is that if you don't understand that God is such a God of love that you can pour all that into, mm -hmm. then you start managing it yourself. And when you start managing it yourself, you dwell on it. And as you dwell on it, I mean, fear, fear grows in our imagination. Yeah. So does love. Love grows in our imagination, so does fear. So if we are able to dictate what is allowed to linger in our imagination, that's calling every thought captive. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that right now, the number one peddled currency in the U.S. right now is fear. Yeah. And we call it love. Hmm. We call it love. And I think uh, no restriction, you know, love wins, that kind of stuff. Like in theory, that's true, but the meaning has swapped. It's not to say that what God has said isn't our best practices is good. It's to say love wins that even in our failures, there's a God big enough to accept that and bring us into a sure. relationship, even as we're working through things. Yeah. I've, I've heard it said it's like a sliver where it, the thought is like a sliver in your brain. And then, you know, like a sliver in your hand where if you just leave it, right, then it festers and becomes a, an ordeal right. versus if it's like you have a bad, you know, or a thought or whatever in it, but then you dig deep into it and why, why did I? Why did I think that and so on and so forth? Then you realize that's a total lie and then you can just, you know. Yeah, and I think the, fr I mean, I, I know I've said it, but that's the framework of understanding who God is. That's mm -hmm. got to be the framework because I remember, I remember I used to say all the time, like, okay, God, don't worry. I'll never do this again or I'll never do that again or okay, that's it. I'm going to do it this way or that way. Like I remember years in my own life, years of like trying to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying so hard to be a Christian and, and, what finally took, what's, what finally allowed me to, to have a relationship with Jesus, even though I didn't understand him fully at the time, what finally stuck is when I finally went to God and I go, well, I mean, you've heard my promises. So I guess now I'm just going to come to you with my failures. I'm going to come to you with my screw ups. I'm probably going to keep doing this. I'm going to probably keep doing that. Like this is, this is me telling God, I'm going to keep doing this and this and this and this, but, but I'll keep bringing that to you. Sure. That's what I have. And it was almost, it was almost anger. It felt like almost anger of like, I want to bring you my successes. I want to bring you my wins. Like, oh, I just want to give all the glory to God and give credit to God. And like, you know, people do in moments of success. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't have that moment to give you. So what I'll do is in the bottom of my failure, I'll bring that to you. And it wasn't until I got to that point mm -hmm. that I felt like I could understand God at a relational level. Yeah. Um, with how fast the world is changing, what do you think are good investments of time and energy, meaning career, family, 
you know, faith of, you know, what for a young person? Boy, that's, I mean, I, I, I honestly can't answer that, but I know that for us, I'm looking at, um, two things. I want to look at contribution at a local level mm -hmm. and theological practices at a global level. And what I mean by that is, okay. is there something we can do at a local level, level to ease the burden of the poor? Because Jesus says the poor you'll have with you always. And I always thought that meant this, the, the group of poor people will always be there. What we're seeing right now is some of the people that used to not be poor are going to become poor right now. Like yeah. we are, we're seeing people that are going to change a lot about their life in the coming months. And if we are prepared to, to lovingly care for the people that are in need, then as a church, what we're able to do, and, and obviously this takes up a lot of my thought time. I mean, what I do through the cattle project doesn't take a lot of time. It takes a lot of physical work. So it gives me the opportunity to give a lot of mental effort to what we're doing at the church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there is there a way to contribute exactly in methods like this? You know, right. for people that have the difficult questions, for people who are like, well, if God's so great, then why this? Well, if God's so great, then why? Well, what about this? Well, what about that? I mean, to me, I think this, to me, is one of the best exercises we could have with our time because it allows people to just sit around and think and kind of ruminate on something. And then tomorrow at work, you know, so... Investment in time, obviously, obviously would be to know Jesus better. Sure. And I used to think I know what that meant. I used to think know Jesus better meant know the Bible better. Okay. But the devil has the Bible memorized. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not to know the Bible better. It's to know Jesus better and to use the Bible to further the depth of who we understand him to be. Yeah. Um, what should anybody, but I mean, a young person look for in a church community? Um, well, two things. Two things is what, the, I mean, that stand out. Are you teaching that God is a God of love and mercy and grace? Mm -hmm. And is that based on what you're finding in the word? Yeah. You know, because if it's so easy, I mean, the, the devil, the devil was talking to, to Jesus on the mountaintop and he said, you know, he's, he's dealing with Jesus at an imagination level. Remember I said, fear or love grow in your imagination. And he's saying, you came to save the world and I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And you don't have to go through the cross. Right. It, it, it's kind of a flawed thought. Um, but when you go to church, it is very easy. I've been, I've been to, I don't know how many churches in my life, hundreds, literally, literally, yeah. maybe thousands. Yeah. Honestly, it's possibly that I've sat through thousands of different church services in different places. And the exact same verse based on your cornerstone of who you believe right. God to be can tell you that God is this way, or it can tell you that God is that way. Mm -hmm. So my, my personal belief would be if it doesn't line up with the entire Bible, beware. Because I'll tell you what, it is easy to sell rules. Like I could stand up there and thump the pulpit and scare people and talk about hell. And I could scare everybody into a lot of decisions, but it's not sustainable because mm -hmm. fear isn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. You can only stay so afraid for so long. And so you've got this high turnover of people. And then when people leave the church, you're like, ah, oh, backslider. Oh, they just couldn't do it. They just couldn't finish the race. You know, it's like Paul says, right. you got to you gotta finish the race and blah, 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 blah. Well, fear is unsustainable. So if you're peddling fear as a religion, then you can't expect that people are going to stay and connect at a heart level. Mm -hmm. So when a young person is looking for a church, I don't think it, I don't think it has to be in person anymore. Yeah. I think you can have a community that's in person. And I think if you don't have a church near you, mm -hmm. that's deepening your understanding of who Jesus is. I don't know that online isn't, I mean, yeah, that's going to ruffle some feathers, but that's, that's, you got to find, you got to find a, a, a place that, deepens your understanding of your core belief about who Jesus is, okay. that, that hinge point of who Jesus is. This one, uh, you know, I think we, we, we share a, a similar view in this, but, uh, so college or work, meaning like, it, you, okay, there's some things, if you're a doctor, please go to college. We want you to know <laughs> how, yeah. if you're cutting into me, what's going on. But yeah, I mean, especially with the, the education system, the way it is right now and with technology, how it is right now, I don't know. What do you see the future coming to for a young person? Um, man, I'm kind of out on going to college. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. mean, if you don't know why you're going, you're just going because the world has told you that's a measure of success mm -hmm. and you're steeped in college debt, student debt. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's turned into a little bit of a gimmick, to be honest. Like if you want to be a mechanic, go be a mechanic. The world needs those. Sure. If you have a, if you have a passion for something, go pursue that because it goes back to what I said, like you're going to be valuable based on what you contribute, not based on what you consume. Mm -hmm. And so the college is peddled. It's like, well, you'll never get the things that you want unless you go through our program. They're teaching you how to be a consumer. I'm saying, no, hang on, hold on, go find a way to contribute. And if you need to be a, a if you, if you're going to be a doctor, 
there's a certain level of certification that you have to be able to provide so that you can go practice medicine. Sure. Lawyer, same thing. Right. But if you want to go contribute to the world in other ways, I, don't, I am so out on the idea of going. And here's the problem. Under compulsion, you go to school and you spend all this money on school because that's what the world says is your measure of success. I, I, I just... I just can't get there. I think you can contribute to the world in other ways. If if there's something you're passionate about, yeah. go for it. If at any point in that process, you see that school is going to be necessary to that, it's always going to be there. Yeah. I mean, the option is always going to be there. So find your passion and whether school applies. Go find to a way to contribute. Go yeah. find a problem in the world and fix it. And if you go find, hey, let me tell you something. This is a little <laughs> cheat life hack. If you go find a problem and you solve it, mm-hmm. the world is going to reward you. Yeah, I promise you the world will reward your efforts. If you find a problem and you master the solution to that problem, you will not be sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, last question, because uh, these are the questions we have. Yeah. And we ran through them. I like it. Uh, And this one's, you know, you touched on it. Okay, so what books do you recommend? Should I be reading? What books should I be reading? Man, um, I have I have trouble and I already I know I already referenced it, but I have trouble just without question suggesting recommending a god-shaped brain because there are things that he talks about that i'm not sure that i agree with okay but i will tell you that one of my main my main core values is i want people to think for themselves i do not want brainless mindless brain dead followers that's not what we're trying to create it's not what we're looking for what i want is i want people that are willing to think for themselves and so if you read any book and there's things that you question go do your own research Mm -hmm. that being said a god-shaped brain is probably one of the most impactful books that i've ever read in my life Mm -hmm. there's a book by caroline leaf that's the perfect you that talks about the role that your choices play and and the mental health involved in choices uh there's a book called by c anything anything by c.s lewis if you can read anything by c.s lewis do it it's going to be hard to keep up with because he was in a different time. And so you, you, you can't just breeze through it. It's something you got to slow down and read anything by CS Lewis. Um, the perfect you by Caroline leaf and a God shaped brain by Timothy James. Okay. Well, we'll be doing this again and we'll get lots of other questions. Sorry. And people will uh, comment them and Levi will say words. Um, but until I think then, it's, I think it's kind of cool. This is, I mean, it's obviously a framework and, and we're giving people the idea of kind of what to expect on our Monday night platform. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so to give them a, give them a week to sort of think about it. And I mean, I think, I think if somebody go ask a question right now, you're like, right. uh, 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 I don't know. But if you've got a week and you just kind of jot them down, like if during the week, if you think of something that you'd want discussed or kind of want our opinion on or more depth on seriously, take notes. I mean, yeah. that's what, that's what this is going to be for or email them in or whatever. But, yeah. um, yeah. Because, I mean, I'll, I'll put down questions, but then we'll also get questions that way. So, anyway, see you next week. Awesome. Okay, cool.